Thanks for watching this video. Today we're going to talk about how to write the winning offer. The objective of this class is for you to understand how the seller would see your offer and for you to be able to explain this to your buyer so when writing the offer you understand how to put the pieces of the, of the puzzle together to make sure you get the best chance of writing the winning offer. First thing you want to do is you want to understand how a seller is going to see your offer. Here's a little pyramid diagram that I've drawn up and at the top of the pyramid, cash. Cash is always king. You've heard that before, right? Why is cash king? Cash is king to a seller because there's not going to be an appraisal usually. There's not going to be any type of loan contingency. And we know that if the house is in good shape, the inspection and disclosure contingency can be removed very quickly. So cash is always king because there's no red tape. Right under cash, HM, hard money. Now, what is hard money? Hard money could be um, money borrowed from Tony Soprano or something like that, you know, uh, a group of investors who are pulling their money together to give you a loan. Maybe you don't have the best credit, maybe you don't have uh, the em employment history or something to that effect, but hard money lenders will give you the capital you need for a short-term basis and a high interest rate to buy the property that you want to purchase. Most of the time when somebody's using a hard money loan, they're using it to R&R property or uh, rehab and resale. We here at Berkshire Hathaway Home Services California Properties, we use the MAP programs, correct? Like the Flipper or the Wealth Builder program. That's basically a hard money loan. So if a seller doesn't have a cash offer on the table, the next best thing for them is a hard money loan. Because again, there may not be an appraisal. There's really not going to be a whole lot of red tape because the borrower is paying such a high interest rate on a short term amount of deal there that hard money lenders are generally very, very generous when it comes to stuff like that. If you don't have a cash deal or a hard money deal to present to the seller, the next best thing is conventional lending. Somebody who has a decent credit score, a decent amount to put down anywhere from 3%, 5%, 10%, but of course, the best conventional loans are 20% down and above because for your buyer, it removes their private mortgage insurance, the PMI. That's the fee that the bank charges somebody, anybody, who is going to be getting a loan for a mortgage and puts less than 20% down. The PMI only covers the bank in case the buyer defaults. doesn't do anything for the principal, interest, taxes, or insurance. It just covers the bank's behind if the buyer defaults. So sellers like that as well. So cash money is top, hard money is second below that. Conventional lending is going to be probably the best product out there, but not everybody can go conventional. So what's next on the pyramid here? FHA loans. FHA loans are probably the most commonly used loan because it doesn't require a great credit score like conventional lending and it also requires a very, very low down payment of 3.5%. So imagine, if you're going to buy a $100,000 piece of property and you need to put 3.5% down for an FHA loan, the borrower only has to come in with $3,500. Compound that to a $200,000 loan. Now we're talking about a $7,000 down payment. Okay? So you get the idea, 3.5% down for an FHA loan. However, with an FHA loan, generally it takes a little bit longer than a conventional loan. Conventional loan, you can close that in 30 to 35 days. If you have a good lender, maybe a little bit less than 30. But with the new TRID rules in place, an FHA loan may take anywhere from 45 up to 60 days to close the deal. So sellers would rather have a conventional loan that can close faster with less red tape. Oh, by the way, conventional lending, generally their appraisals are a little bit less conservative, maybe a half a point up to a point in the appraisal value. Whereas FHA and VA for that matter are going to be a lot more conservative and maybe lower the price of the property via the appraisal slightly, not too much, but slightly. And a good listing agent knows that. So again, the objective is to see how the sellers view your buyer's offer, and if you have the opportunity to go between conventional or FHA loans, always try to get your buyer to go conventional. They stand a better chance 
of getting the deal and you writing the winning offer. Last but not least, on the bottom of our pyramid, unfortunately our veterans get the short end of the stick when it comes to mortgage lending. And the reason for that is FHA and VA are very similar in their conservative approach to appraisals. They also take anywhere from 45 to 60 days to close the deal, whereas a conventional again can close between 30 and 35, usually if you have a great lender, slightly under 30. Also, FHA and VA share a lot of the same requirements regarding red tape and conditions for the buyer. Um, however, with VA loans, there is something called buyer non-allowables, not seller. The seller wishes they could pay this stuff, right? Uh, not. But the buyer has to make sure the seller pays for certain items, like the termite report. On FHA or conventional hard money or cash deals, a borrower does not have to ask for a termite report or termite section 1 or termite section 2 clearance. Now, I'm not going to have time to talk about the difference between section 1 and section 2 clearance. Just understand that a VA buyer is absolutely always going to have to have a termite report, section 1 clearance, and section 2 clearance, and the buyer cannot pay for it even if the buyer has the capital to do so, is ready and willing to do so, the VA will not allow it. There's a couple of other non-allowables, but since we're talking about loans here, I'm not a loan officer, I suggest you speak to one of our preferred loan officers at uh, Bristol Home Mortgage, or Gem Mortgage, I should say. Give them a call and they'll be able to walk you through the non-allowables here. The idea of this graph here is to show you how a seller views the offers that come in. Imagine if there's multiple offers on the table. A good listing agent is going to break these down for their seller and say, hey, the cash ones are the best. Hard money is the next best thing. Conventional is after that. FHA is beneath conventional and cash, of course. And VA is at the bottom of the totem pole only because the buyer cannot pay for certain things and a seller must pay for those costs. That's how sellers and good listing agents see your offers just based on financing. I hope that makes sense. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Okay guys, welcome back. What we're going to talk about now is a way for you to get your FHA and VA buyers maybe to the higher uh, pole position. What I want you to do is write a personalized letter for your offer. So if you have John and Jane and they have two children, you know, Timmy and Jane Jr., I guess, um, you can write a personalized letter explaining why John and Jane love this house, what John and Jane do for a living, how old are their kids, do they have a dog, how do they see themselves fitting into the community after they purchase this house. So personalized letters are great ways for you to humanize your offer. And especially with our VA guys, we know they're at the bottom of the totem pole in the eyes of a seller because of the non-allowables, all the red tape they have to cut through to get their loan, and the time frame it takes to close the deal. Lots of times, we all have, well, not all of us, but lots of times, we have or know somebody who served in the military. And a lot of times, it's a sweet spot for some sellers. Remember, people who have created a family, created a life, and enjoyed memories in a piece of property, when they sell it, it's not always about the dollar sign. Sometimes it's about the emotional appeal. I'm sure you've heard this before. Some sellers want to sell a property to a family that's going to take care of the house just like they did. A personalized letter, maybe even a nice color photo, would help explain who the buyers are, what their family background is, what they've done if they have any service you know, military service background, what they do for a living, how they see themselves fitting into the community, and what they love about the house. That might be a good way for you to emotionally appeal to the seller other than just throwing the most money at them. But I should warn you, even the most heartfelt letter is not going to make a difference if the cash and the terms don't meet the seller's requirements. So try writing a personalized letter and attach that to the top of your offer when sending it off to the listing agent 
you might get a good response. All right, guys. So now you understand how sellers see the financing or cash options. You understand that a personalized letter might help you get the slight edge over other buyers who aren't telling their story. But let's say this, you understand that you've written a nice letter uh, prior to actually writing the offer. So you go to see a house, your sellers, I'm sorry, your buyers love the property. They're standing outside in the front yard, they're looking back and they're thinking, man, I hope we get this house. What do you do next? Call the listing agent. Call the listing agent. Don't text, don't email. Call the listing agent right there on the spot, maybe in the driveway of the property, and put the listing agent on speakerphone. Why do I say do it right then and there? Why do I say put it on speakerphone? Here's why. In this day and age, 2017 as I'm filming this, so many of us are used to communicating on our cell phones, okay. texting, emailing, all that stuff. But let me ask you, do you think that you're going to get the best response by emailing somebody or sending them a text message versus talking to them face to face or having a phone call? You know, majority of the way we communicate as human beings is uh, voice inflection and tone, okay, body language, things like that. It's very easy for you to send me a message and for me to send you back a very cold, dry, canned response. However, if I can get in front of you face to face or I can get you on the phone, that means that we can have a little bit more of a detailed conversation. I could also tell by the tone in your voice and the body language that you're giving to me how you feel about the conversation and whatnot. So, I implore you to call the listing agent, even if they say on the MLS, text only or email only. Call them. Call them anyways. Call them with your buyers right there listening in on speakerphone. The reason why I want you to have your clients listening in on speakerphone is so they can understand how the listing agent is responding to you. Okay? Now, what do you say when you have them on the phone? You ask questions, lots of questions, but you always start with something to the effect of this. Uh, hey, Ryan, this is Vic with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, California Properties. We're standing in front of your house, 123 Main Street, here in the city of Los Angeles. It's a great property. I just showed it, and my clients love it. We want to write an offer, and we know it's listed for $500,000. And I'm calling to ask you, Ryan, do you have any offers right now at or above asking price? That's your first question. Do you have any offers? at or above asking price. Now, there's three ways they can respond to you. They can say yes, they can say no, or they can tell you nothing at all. They can completely stonewall you. But the idea is, if you don't ask, you don't get the answers, okay? So, Ryan, do you have any offers at or above listing price of $500,000? If they say yes, well, Ryan, it's a great house. I can see why somebody wrote the offer at asking price or maybe even higher. Do you mind if I ask, do you have any offers higher than 510? 515? 525? Just probe a little bit, guys. Ask the questions. They may give you all the answers. They may give you nothing. But if you don't ask, you'll never know. Now, if they say they don't have any offers at the time, what do you think that means? It means you might be able to write the offer at asking price or possibly slightly below asking price and still be able to secure the property for your clients. Now, if they completely stonewall you and say, hey, uh, I can't tell you anything about our offers, just go ahead and submit your best offer and good luck to you. And you try every other way to maneuver and ask questions, they still don't give you any information. At least you tried. And your buyers are listening in to the conversation and they understand that the agent isn't giving anything up so we have to put our best foot forward to try to write the winning offer so after you see the property they love it call right then and there put them on speakerphone ask the question any offers at or above asking price hopefully you can use that to your advantage of course if you don't ask you'll never know alright guys 
So now you know if there's any other offers on the table. Or maybe you don't know anything, but that's okay. You tried, you asked, and if you don't ask, you'll never know. Let's talk about something now on the contract that you can do to help push your offer to the top of the heap. Earnest money deposit. That's one of the first financial lines there on paragraph three of your residential purchase agreement, correct? Yeah, it is. Earnest money deposit, or you'll see it on the MLS as EMD, okay? EMD equals earnest money deposit. That's basically your skin in the game, your uh, collateral, your check that your client's going to write and say, hey, take that off the market, here's some money, let's open an escrow, and give me a 30 to 45 day window to close the deal. But you can't negotiate with anybody else, just me. That's your earnest money deposit. Now, in Southern California, traditionally, you're going to be required to put a 1% down for the earnest money deposit. So imagine if it's a $500,000 house, you're going to have to put down for earnest money deposit at least $5,000 into escrow. That's also the money that, based on the liquidated damages clause, if you fail to close the deal after all contingencies have been removed, that's the money you're going to give up to the seller as liquidated damages for you not closing the deal. Basically, money you're giving back to the seller for wasting their time and not closing the deal, okay? You never want to lose your client's earnest money deposit. It's better to lose the house than to lose the deposit because there'll always be another house that comes on the market. But if you lose the house and you lose the earnest money deposit, Boy, oh boy, you're in for some trouble, possibly a lawsuit, and I can guarantee you they're never going to work with you again. You don't want that happening, okay? So let's talk about earnest money deposit and how you can manipulate it to get yourself a better chance of writing the winning offer. We talked to Ryan about his $500,000 listing at 123 Main Street. So it's a $500,000 listing, and traditionally in Southern California, we put 1% down. That's 5000 bucks. But imagine if you put 5,000 bucks down, 1% earnest money deposit, but a competing agent offers the same price, 500,000, but puts 3% earnest money down, which is 15,000, what do you think a seller is going to do? They're going to take the $5,000 earnest money deposit offer, or they're going to take the $15,000 earnest money deposit offer? Ding, ding, ding. This one's going to win out because the buyer is more confident that they're not going to drop the ball on the deal and lose their money. They're more confident that they're putting another $10,000 down and are willing to risk losing it if they don't close the deal. Put yourself in a seller's position. Who would you rather take a gamble on? Somebody who's putting 1% down or somebody who's putting 3% down? That's an easy choice. However, I would tell you the reason why we don't really want you to put any more than 3% down is because based on the liquidated damages clause in the California Residential Purchase Agreement, it states that if the buyer does default on the transaction, they have to give up no more than 3% of the total, the total purchase price to the seller. Okay? So imagine if uh, you know, this client here, 500000 puts 10% down. They put $50,000 down for earnest money deposit. And then they drop the ball. They default on the transaction. California State says that the buyer can only lose a maximum of 3%. They can't lose the entire 10%. So 7% goes back to the buyer. The 3% stays with the seller as liquidated damages. Showing somebody a 3% earnest money deposit means that you're willing to go to the maximum that the law allows to close the deal. And in case you don't, they get to keep that 3% in their pocket, all cash, you can't get it back, for wasting their time and dropping the ball in the transaction. Now, if your clients don't have the ability to do more than 1%, that's okay. But if they do, Try to go higher. Try to go 3% down. Think about it. Who would you rather take into escrow? Somebody who's putting $5,000 or somebody who's putting $15,000 down? That's an easy choice. 
And you, as an agent, should be able to explain this to your clients when writing the offer. All right, guys, so now we've talked about earnest money deposits. What's something else you can do to try to help your client write the winning offer? Well, let's talk about the built-in contingencies. Your contingencies, the way I like to explain them to my buyer clients is, these are hurdles that you have to get over before you can close the deal. Also, these contingencies need to be formally removed on paper, and once they're all removed on paper, that earnest money deposit, whatever it may be, one to three percent of the total purchase price, will go to the seller in case you don't close the deal. So make sure these contingencies are in place, okay? especially if you have a buyer getting a mortgage. If you have a client who's getting an all cash deal, maybe a hard money loan, maybe you don't need an appraisal. And since it's all cash, maybe you don't need a loan contingency because, hello, there's no loan. So let's talk about the three contingencies that are built into your contract already. The first contingency you're going to run into is the appraisal contingency. You have 17 calendar days to remove this contingency in writing. What that means is your loan officer, as soon as you guys agree to terms, hopefully you write the winning offer, you, go open, you open an escrow, you're going to submit the executed contract to your lender. Your lender is then going to order an appraisal report to be done. Now, hopefully your appraisal doesn't take too long because you have to have the appraisal report completed and turned in within 17 days upon reaching an agreement with the seller to buy a house or a piece of property. So 17 days, guys, appraisal has to be completed and turned in. With the appraisal contingency, what it states in the contract is that the appraisal report value shall be no less than the purchase price value. Okay, so if you wrote the purchase contract for Ryan's listing at 123 Main Street at $500,000, but the appraisal comes in at $495,000, you as a buyer have a couple of options. Okay, you can come up with the extra $5,000. Okay, from 495 to 500, make up the difference there in cash out of your own pocket to close the deal. That's option number one. Option number two is asking the seller to lower the price on a purchase agreement addendum to lower the price to match the appraisal value, and in this case, would be 495. Of course, the seller always has the option to say, no, we're not gonna lower the price. Okay? Always provide them with a copy of their appraisal report when it comes in low to justify and back up your reasoning for wanting a lower purchase price value. The third way you can negotiate this is you could have the buyer and seller come somewhere in between. Okay? They can meet in the middle. So if the appraisal value came in at $495, but the purchase price is $500,000, well, you can always have the buyer come up $2,500 in cash out of their pocket and the seller eat. $2,500 out of the purchase price, and ultimately you end up with the purchase price of $497,500. That works sometimes too. The fourth option is if you cannot come to terms with the seller based on the low appraisal value, you could walk away from the deal. Take your appraisal, I'm sorry, you have to eat that appraisal fee, but you can take your earnest money deposit with you whatever the amount may be. So you'll be out the appraisal money, and if you did your home inspection, you'll be out that money too, but um, an appraisal and a home inspection are not gonna cost you nearly as much as an earnest money deposit would. So again, you'd rather uh, make sure you lose the house rather than lose the deposit money and the house, okay? So those are your options. Appraisal, 17 days. Loan approval, that's going to be your second contingency. Now, you can't control the uh, loan approval because you're not a loan officer, but they have 21 days to get the full loan approval for your buyer. If you can do that, you can remove the contingency. The one contingency that we can control as real estate agents and brokers is the inspections and the disclosures. Paragraph 14 says that we have 17 days to remove these contingencies. And if you're smart, 
you have a great loan officer, you can manipulate these to make your offer more attractive. My loan officer and I will chop this down from 17 to 14 days. Why? Because we want to make sure the seller understands we're not going to take all the time needed to do this. We're going to try to do it as fast as possible. Loan approval. This is a tough one. It's not for you and I as real estate agents and brokers to answer. This is strictly for the loan officer. Can they lower this time frame or not? Now, inspections and disclosures, 17 days in my opinion is way too much. If possible, I like to chop this down to 10 days or less. I want to get in there, do our professional home inspection, and if we're going to cancel the deal, let's cancel it fast so we can move on to the next property. That's how you can manipulate the contingencies in your favor. All right, guys. So we've talked about different contingencies, and here's something else you may want to keep in mind to help you write the winning offer. Concessions. No, not concessions at Dodger Stadium or over at Staples while you're watching the Lakers and the Clippers go at it. Concessions on the contract. Anything that you're asking the seller to pay for or that cost them money out of their pocket to help you close the deal. The most common concessions that a buyer may ask for would be closing costs, home warranty, any type of cosmetic repairs, maybe a roof certification, termite work, HOA fees, septic tank cleaning and clearance, escrow or title fees, or possibly a plain old-fashioned discounted purchase price. Anything that you're asking for that takes away from the seller's ability to keep money in their pocket during the transaction is considered a concession. Imagine this. We're writing the offer for $500,000 on Ryan's listing, 123 Main Street, Los Angeles. $500,000 purchase price. But if we're asking for $10,000 back towards the buyer's recurring and non-recurring closing costs, is our offer really $500,000? No, it's $490,000 because we're putting five hundred dollars on paper, but we're subtracting ten dollars for our own closing costs, and the seller should see that. They really look at their net sheet and say, wait a minute. This offer at $500,000 is getting us less money than this other offer at $495,000. Hopefully that makes sense to you, but I just want to make sure you understand. Concessions, keeping these things to a minimum, is the way to go if your client doesn't absolutely need it. In 2017, it's a seller's market, so the best offer wins. Hopefully, you call the agent, you make contact, you ask how the offers are going, and where maybe you should come in at. You also make sure your earnest money deposit is very strong. You maybe lower some of the time frames on your contingencies and of course reduce your concessions. Of course if your buyer absolutely needs closing costs to do the deal there's no getting around it. But if you can avoid asking for as many concessions as possible. Wait for a buyer's market like it was in 2008 and 2009 then you'll get everything you want. Hopefully you enjoyed this class. See you next time.